Hello students, welcome to our lesson in a truly fascinating topic, how plants create new life. We see plants all around us, but have you ever wondered how they make new ones? Today, we're going to dive deep into the world of plant reproduction. We'll explore the two main methods they use, sexual and asexual reproduction. We'll see how flowers play a crucial role, how seeds are formed, and the incredible ways they travel to find a new home. Let's get started on this green adventure. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is reproduction? It's the fundamental process by which an organism, in this case a plant, gives birth to a new organism of its own kind. Think of it as how plant families grow. Plants use two very different strategies for this. The first is sexual reproduction, which is common in flowering plants. This method involves combining male and female cells to create a seed, which can then grow into a new plant with traits from both parents. The second method is asexual reproduction, where a new plant grows directly from a part of the parent plant, like a piece of its root, stem, or leaf. This new plant is essentially a clone, an exact copy of its parent. We will explore both of these amazing processes in detail. Here's a fun fact. The world's largest single flower, the Rafflesia arnoldi, can grow up to three feet across, but you wouldn't want it in a bouquet. To attract the flies it needs for pollination, it gives off a powerful spell of decaying flesh. Now, let's zoom in on sexual reproduction. The main stage for this is the flower. A flower isn't just pretty, it's a highly sophisticated reproductive machine. It contains both male and female parts. The male part is called the stamen, which consists of the anther and a stalk called the filament. The anther's job is to produce tiny grains called pollen. These pollen grains contain the male reproductive cells. The female part is called the pistil, or carpal. It has a sticky top called the stigma, a tube-like structure called the style, and a base called the ovary. Inside the ovary are the ovules, which contain the female reproductive cells. For reproduction to happen, pollen from the anther must get to the stigma. Did you know that not all flowers have both male and female parts? Plants like pumpkins and zucchinis produce separate male and female flowers. The male flowers provide the pollen, but only the pollinated female flowers will actually grow into the vegetable we eat. So, how does the pollen get from the male part to the female part? This process is called pollination. It often happens with the help of wind, water, or animals like bees and butterflies. Once a pollen grain lands on the sticky stigma, it's showtime. The pollen grain grows a tiny thread-like tube called a pollen tube. This tube travels all the way down through the style and into the ovary, searching for an ovule. The male reproductive cell, or male gamete, then travels down this tube. Where it reaches the ovule, it fuses with the female gamete inside. This fusion of the male and female gametes is called fertilization. The result is a single fertilized cell called a zygote, which holds the blueprint for a whole new plant. Speaking of pollination, some plants are master tricksters. The bee orchid, for example, has a flower that perfectly mimics the look and scent of a female bee. Male bees are fooled into trying to mate with the flower and end up getting pollen all over them, which they then carry to the next orchid they visit. Clever, isn't it? After fertilization, the flower's job is almost done, and it begins a beautiful transformation. The petals wither and fall away, as all the plant's energy now goes into developing the future generation. The zygote begins to divide and grow, developing into an embryo, which is essentially a tiny baby plant, complete with a baby shoot and a baby root. The ovule that contains this embryo hardens its outer layer and becomes the seed. And what about the ovary that surrounded the ovule? It swells up and ripens, becoming the fruit. So when you eat an apple or a peach, you're actually eating the mature ovary of a flower, and its main purpose is to protect the seeds inside. Here's a fruity fact that might surprise you. A strawberry isn't technically a berry. The red, fleshy part we love to eat is actually the swollen end of a flower's stem. And those little things on the outside that we call seeds? Each one is actually a tiny fruit in itself. You know those tumbleweeds you see rolling across the desert in movies? That's actually a form of seed dispersal. The entire plant 
breaks off from its root and tumbles with the wind, dropping its seeds all over the landscape. Let's look at some of these dispersal methods. For wind dispersal, seeds are often very small and light, or they have special features to help them fly. Think of the fluffy white hairs on a dandelion seed that act like a parachute, or the wing-like structures on a maple or elm seed that make them spin and blithe through the air. For plants that live in or near water, the seeds or fruits are often buoyant and waterproof. The classic example is the coconut, whose thick, fibrous husk allows it to float for months across oceans to find a new shore. Then there's the most dramatic method, explosion. Some plants, like peas or beans, grow their seeds in a pod. When the pod dries, the tension builds up until it suddenly twists and bursts open, flinging the seeds in all directions. Speaking of explosions, the fruit of the dynamite tree is a real powerhouse. When it ripens, it explodes with a loud crack like a firecracker and can fling its seeds more than 100 feet away at speeds faster than a cheetah can run. Animals are some of the most important seed dispersers. There are a couple of ways they help out. First, many plants wrap their seeds in delicious fleshy fruits. Animals like birds, bears, and monkeys eat the fruit. The seed's tough outer coat protects it from being digested, so it passes through the animal's gut and is eventually deposited in a new location, complete with a small pile of fertilizer. The second method is hitchhiking. Some plants produce seeds with tiny hooks, barbs, or spines. When an animal brushes past the plant, these seeds latch onto its fur or feathers. The animal carries the seed along until it eventually falls off or is groomed off, far from where it is. Here's an amazing fun fact. The handy fastener Velcro was directly inspired by seed dispersal. After a walk, a Swiss engineer named Georges de Mistral examined the burrs stuck to his dog's fur under a microscope. He saw they had tiny hooks that grabbed onto the loops and the fur, and he used this hook and loop idea to create Velcro. Now let's switch gears to the other method, asexual reproduction. This type of reproduction doesn't involve flowers, pollination, or seeds. Instead, a new plant grows from a part of the parent plant. This is also known as vegetative propagation. Because it comes from just one parent, the new plant is a genetic clone, an exact copy of the original. This is a much faster way to reproduce than growing from a seed. Many plants we use for food are grown this way. New plants can sprout from modified roots, like in carrots and sweet potatoes. They can also grow from stems. A potato, for example, is an underground stem and the eyes on it can sprout into new potato plants. Ginger is another type of stem that can be used. And amazingly, some plants like bryophyllum and even grow new plantlets right from the edges of their leaves. Here's a mind-blowing fact about cloning. In Utah, there's a forest of aspen trees called Pando. It looks like thousands of individual trees, but it's actually a single organism. All the trees are clones, connected by a massive underground root system, and they are genetically identical. It's one of the heaviest and oldest living things on Earth. So let's quickly review what we've learned today about the incredible ways plants reproduce. We saw that plants have two main strategies, sexual reproduction, which involves flowers and the fusion of gametes to create a genetically unique seed, and asexual reproduction, or vegetative propagation, which creates an exact clone from a parent plant's root, stem, or leaf. In sexual reproduction, the process of fertilization leads to the development of an embryo within a seed, while the flower's ovary matures into a fruit to protect it. Finally, we explored the crucial step of seed dispersal, where plants use the forces of nature, like wind, water, animals, and even explosive force, to spread their seeds far and wide, ensuring the survival of their species. And for one final amazing fact, the record for the oldest seed to ever be germinated belongs to a Judean date palm seed. It was about 2,000 years old when archaeologists found it, and scientists were able to successfully sprout it into a new tree. That's one patient seed. And that concludes our journey into the world of plant reproduction. It's amazing to think about the complex and clever strategies plants use to create new life, from the intricate design of a flower to the incredible journey of a single seed. 
The next time you see a flower, eat a fruit, or see a weed pop up in a new place, you'll know the fascinating science behind it. Keep exploring the world around you and stay curious.